I'm Lance Grandy. I'm a member of the uh, Council's Board of Directors, and I'm also chair of the Program Committee. My day job is as distinguished uh, service curator and a past vice president of the Field Museum. The Chicago Council on Science and Technology is a nonprofit organization that seeks to increase the public's understanding of current science and technology and its importance in the Chicago region. Today's program is the 84th that we've had over seven years. And we couldn't have done this without the support of our sponsors, our speakers, and uh, you, our members. Your continued support is greatly appreciated and will allow us to continue to bring you programs of the kind you're going to see tonight. And if you're not yet a member, um, if you do join up, you'll be able to get into our future programs either for free or at a discount. I mean, the, um, the wine and cheese is worth that alone. So <laughs> today's topic is an evolutionary view of human reproductions of human reproduction, and our speaker is Dr. Robert D. Martin. He's the A. Watson Armour Curator of Anthropology at the Field Museum. Bob's a highly distinguished scientist, and in addition to his uh, appointment at the Field Museum, he's also an adjunct professor at the University of Chicago, uh, the University of Illinois, and even here at uh, Northwestern University. Bob came to Chicago in 2001 after 15 years as professor and director of the Anthropological Institute at the University of Zurich, Switzerland. He has nearly 300 publications to his credit, and he's one of the world's leading physical anthropologists today. His, pres his presentation this evening will focus on declining sperm counts and what this could mean for human evolution. It will also feature parts of Bob's new book, How We Do It. It's quite a provocative title. But, uh, <laughs> but it's actually an extremely interesting study of um, many parts of human reproduction in an evolutionary context. After his talk, we'll have about 20 minutes for questions um, and answers. And uh, after the Q&A, uh, Dr. Martin is going to be able to sign his new book, which will be available in the lobby for the modest price of $20. I hope I got that price right. Did I? Christy? Yes. Okay, good. $20. All right. um, also, I, at this time, I would like to ask anybody who has a cell phone to please turn it off. You hear that all the time now, and um, I still hear cell phones go off sometimes, so. my own included. I just want to say one more thing. Um, Bob and I have been curators together at the Field Museum for more than 12 years, and five of those years, um, we actually were both doing administration there together. So um, I, he and I even published a paper together in 2005, so Bob is also a colleague and a friend, and, and it's really with great, great pleasure tonight that I'm able to introduce him. So without further ado, um, here's Bob Martin. Well, I'd like to thank Lance for that introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for coming along to listen to me tonight. I have to warn you that for the past week I've had severe bronchitis and took my last antibiotic pill today. And uh, it's kind of symptomatic because during a uh, cocktail hour my watch stopped working. And uh, one sign of Lance's great friendship is I now have his watch on my wrist. Uh, so I hope that both I and the watch will uh, hold out for the next hour. So please bear with me. Uh, the other thing that I have to tell you is that that title of the book, How We Do It, is not my title. Uh, this book has developed over 40 years in the course of my research, and I always wanted to write it one day, but somehow never got around to it. My title was uh, Natural Mothers, and I wanted to put the emphasis on the uh, female contribution to reproduction, which in mammals is far exceeds anything the males do. But my publishers knew better. 
And in fact, they knew so much better, they wanted to put a half-peeled banana on the cover. Uh, and with a, with a local attorney, I managed to put a stop to that. So uh, at least you know that sometimes the author wins. Anyway, I had to choose a topic to talk about tonight, and I'm, try I'm giving various presentations in Chicago, and I'm trying to vary things uh, around. So, so far, I've tended to talk about the evolution of mothering, and I thought I'd choose a topic that is very different for this evening, so I chose the question of uh, sperm production and sperm counts. And... Uh, one of the things is that there's a lot of basic ideas that we carry with us in this and basic conceptions about how the system works. And there are unanswered questions. And one of them is why do we need an average now, if we take an average for today across humanity, why do we need an average of a quarter of a billion sperms in a single ejaculate? Uh, for fertility. Uh, it takes one sperm to do the job, as this cartoon indicates. So what are the others doing there? And very little uh, research has been directed to this topic. And in the literature at the present, there are really only two viable alternatives as, as proposed ideas for why you need so many sperms in the first place. And the first one on the left is a relatively simplistic one, sperm wars. The idea that uh, males are always going to come into competition, so they should produce as many sperms as they can to compete. Um, <clears throat> there's a basic question here about why it always works out that you end up with uh, a very small number of eggs produced by the females and vast numbers of sperms produced by males this difference between relatively large eggs in small numbers and relatively small sperms in large numbers. This is called anisogamy, and nobody has really explained why it ever evolved. But uh, the people on the sperm oil side try to explain the vast numbers of sperms as a response to uh, the threat of competition between males. But the... Uh, the question is, if you have a species where there is no competition between males, if we look across primates, as I'll show you, there are species that have competition, species that don't. If we look across those species that have no apparent competition, why do they still need to have so many sperms? But the other kind of explanation is a different one. It's a deeper one. And unfortunately, it's based just on a correlation and the idea is that if you look at the graph on the right, what you have on the ascending axis is numbers of sperm, sperm counts. And across here is a measure of the genetic variability among the sex cells. Uh, you probably all learned in school that when the sex cells are formed, there's a special process of cell division. And during this process, the arms of the chromosomes overlap and exchange material this is a process known as crossing over. And it's one of the main sources of variability between sex cells. And what this graph shows is, is quite a good correlation between the numbers of sperms produced and the numbers of crossing overs uh, between the chromosomes. So the more the chromosomes cross over and create variability, the higher the sperm count. So it looks almost as if the number of lottery tickets printed, the, the, the uh, number of sperms in the ejaculate, uh, uh, is higher the, the more variability there is in the system. So you have to have enough uh, lottery tickets for all of the various possibilities to be present. That would be a simple interpretation of that. So uh, that is one kind of possibility, that the reason there are so many sperms is that we have to somehow allow all of that variability to come into play. And unfortunately, we haven't got beyond that point, so it's really uh, just an unanswered question. And I talked about uh, things that are generally uh, assumed or accepted, 
One of them, which I've always vaguely uh, accepted without thinking about, is that um, this is some kind of race. That here you have a huge marathon with 250 million entrants, and uh, the one that runs fastest wins. Now, running fastest may be of no significance biologically whatsoever, um, uh, but there's this assumption here that the sperm that, that actually gets through to fertilize the egg is somehow the best equipped. Uh, but we, there's no way in which the sperms can be selected, presumably because the, the hereditary material, the DNA in the head of the sperm, is essentially crystalline. And I can't see any way in which it could be recognized or assessed. And so the question is, is there some kind of competition here, or is it simply a question of having a lottery and ensuring that all of that variability is in play? What we do know from the few studies that have been conducted is that it is not the sperms that get first to the site of ovulation that are necessarily, uh, in fact, it seems it's unlikely that they are the sperms that fertilize the egg. This happens later in the process. And so there's a lot we really don't know about the process. And I really want to emphasize that because we are dealing with problems of infertility in many cases. It's a huge problem throughout the world, and it's likely to increase for reasons that I will show you. So we really need to understand the mechanics. There's what, why do we need so many sperm? <coughs> there was a very neat paper in Nature uh, just a few months back in which they, had, they managed to track the movement of individual sperm. And I must say, when you watch this video uh, on the uh, screen, uh, the sense that I got was a complete disorganization. I mean, sperm blundering around. Uh, the average condition is, is essentially blundering. From time to time, there will be a fairly straightforward course, but the sperm will be following a helical course, but that they may then become uh, hyperhelical. And some of the time they're hyperactivated. And so generally there is no great sense of directionality looking at a sperm sample. And it seems as though most of the time <clears throat> it's not the sperm swimming that matters. And there's a very simple way of demonstrating this. As Lance knows, a lot of the work that I have done compares big and small animals because my conviction is that we, in order to understand the biology of, of any system, we need to take uh, body size into account. Body size influences practically everything. Um, if you look at testis size, as I will do later, you have to take body size into account to compare the size of the testes between species. But the really amazing thing is that when you look at the sex cells, they are the same size, give or take, the same size regardless of body size. And so the example here takes a mouse, a human, and a whale, and the sperms are, and the eggs are virtually the same size in all three. Uh, and this is because in uh, size difference between animals, it's not bigger animals having bigger cells, but bigger animals having more cells of the same size. That's how it works. And so a whale has many, many more cells than a mouse, but the size of its egg is the same as the size of the egg in a mouse. Now that alone tells us that there must be active transport to get the sperm up next to the egg because you cannot possibly have the same system operating in something the size of a mouse as in the, uh, something with the plumbing of the size of a, of a gray whale. And in fact, there's a lot of neat work done on uh, humans and other mammals showing that there is active transport. So the sperms are carried most of the way by transport, by pumping mechanisms in the womb and the oviducts. And the active swimming part of the sperms is a um, is for the last stretch, and they they can recognise the presence of an egg, and then they get really excited. But uh, it looks as though they're carried pa passively 
a fair amount of the time. <coughs> Which now brings me to an important question, is how many sperms do you actually need? We know that the average human ejaculate has a quarter of a billion sperms, but how many do you actually need in an ejaculate for fertility? And um, there is good evidence from domestic mammals that uh, the, number, the basic number you need is pretty large. Uh, unfortunately, in this graph, the, uh, the direction goes in, uh, opposite to expected. These are high sperm counts, and these are low sperm counts at the right. So sperm counts are increasing from right to left. And then here we have the percentage of successful matings with ewes. And you can see in the red bars here, up to about uh, 60 million sperms per ejaculate, uh, there is less than 50% success. Whereas above that threshold, the threshold being here, anything to the left of that is close to 100. And so it looks as though a ram has to have uh, at least 60 million sperm in, in an ejaculate to be normally fertile and 100 million to be on the safe side. Uh, certainly tens of millions of sperms have to be present for fertility. And similar uh, data are available for humans. Uh, this may be, be a bit difficult to read because of the lighting, but basically uh, you start at the bottom and the left-hand column shows you the sperm counts in categories. So this is 1 to 20. This is per cc, so multiply by 3 to get the total sperm count. So that's up to uh, 60 million in an ejaculate. 20 to 40, 40 to 60, and then... 60 to 100, so there's 100 would be 300 million sperms in an ejaculate. That's around the average today. And what you can see is that below that figure, below uh, 60 million, that's 180 million per ejaculate, you have declining fertility from 27% down to 2.7%. The right column shows you fertility. So at these very low sperm, uh, uh, sperm <coughs> concentrations, you have very low fertility, but you have somewhat lowered fertility even when you have up to 180 million sperm present. So below a threshold of about 150 million sperms in an ejaculate, there is going to be somewhat lowered uh, fertility. I've deliberately taken that because it's an early study in 1953. If we take a far more recent study, we have uh, more data here. And I'll just take the top graph. It takes sperm concentration again. So this is a uh, number of sperms per cubic centimeter of ejaculate. And you can see that and the y-axis shows uh, Fertility, it, it shows the percentage of women becoming pregnant with a partner with that particular sperm count. And you can see that the curve goes upwards and then flattens off, and beyond about 50, uh, there is no further increase in fertility. The maximum fertility achievable per cycle is about 20%, one in five, and that is achieved with anything from a sperm concentration of 50 million per cc, which is 150 million sperms per ejaculate. Uh, below that, there is some fertility, but it is declining. And so clearly up to quite a high level of 150 million sperms in the ejaculate, there is uh, an increase in fertility, and you have to get up to that level to reach normal fertility, which then persists at higher levels. So uh, the, that huge number of sperms that we've seen, that number is necessary. We don't understand why. But for fertility, the evidence tells us that we have to have relatively high sperm counts. 
Now, the reason I'm hammering this is because there is now good evidence that sperm counts in men are declining. Okay, and this has been quite controversial. It's been very much like the climate controversy. And in fact, similar comments have been made in this area as have been made in the, in the uh, climate field. But um, this all started off with a single paper in 78 by an author who compared sperm counts at his institution at 40-year interval and found a distinct difference. And then there was study after study, and most of them were reporting some kind of decline. And it was, became obvious fairly soon that there were differences between regions. In some regions there was decline, in some regions there wasn't, and the decline was happening earlier in some places, later in others. Um, but it, this study, uh, in fact, in 1992, there was a study by Carlson et al., which are the blue points, and then a, a uh, a study by the same set of authors in 2000 added the, tr the red data, which are the triangles. And they essentially confirmed what they said in a 1992 review paper, which is uh, having reviewed all of the evidence, there was clear evidence of decline shown by that dotted line. Now, a number of things obvious from that graph. First of all, there is a lot of scatter. As I've said, things differ from population to population. Secondly, uh, it is not clear whether that is a nice linear decline or whether, uh, as was suggested by one group, is in fact a step function that you get high levels up till 1960 and then a drop in sperm counts uh, after 1960. And so that is uh, an alternative, alternative interpretation of those data. And that was, in fact, the most worrying criticism because I think the evidence speaks for itself. There has clearly been a decline in sperm counts in many areas of the industrialized world. The question is, what is going on? But the most worrying criticism was the step function because it was argued that the way in which sperms were counted had changed in 1960. And that in fact, all we're looking at is a difference in high sperm counts before the change and low sperm counts after. And that I found as a scientist potentially worrying if it were true, then it could simply uh, eliminate any value for these data. Now, there are two basic lines of evidence speak firmly against that. So one of them is that there are more recent studies looking at data after 1990. This graph ends in 1990. And one of them is very recently uh, from Israel. And what we see is that uh, there is clear evidence of declining sperm counts from 1994 to 2009. Uh, to the extent that the people who did this study at a fertility clinic in Israel said that they were no longer able to get enough sperm donors with adequate sperm counts for their clinic and that they are seriously worried about this. So this is Israel. And then France, in a study covering, covering the entire country, uh, going from 1989 and to, until 2005, so essentially not overlapping with a previous study showing clear decline in sperm counts. And so that cannot be explained by any change in uh, sperm counting method because there has, certainly hasn't been any change in method during that period. But in fact, the argument of changing sperm counts is vacuous, and uh, this is a beautiful piece of uh, lateral thinking. A, uh, a veterinary uh, specialist in, in Australia, Satchel, said, well, if uh, they change sperm count methods, we also use the same methods for uh, cattle and for other domestic mammals. So, uh, if changing sperm count methods are responsible for the change, then we should see a similar shift. And so if you look at the domestic 
bull and the pig, there is no decline in sperm counts over that period. These are useful comparative data anyway. This is the kind of question we need to ask. It's about what about our mammalian relatives? It isn't happening. Their sperm counts aren't declining. Ours are. And there's clear evidence of this happening f with increasing frequency in more and more countries around the world, and it's very worrying. And I think we need to find out why this is happening and do something about it. Okay, now I'd like to take a lighter, somewhat lighter approach to uh, this question of sperm competition now. And uh, uh, unfortunately, there are several studies uh, published quite recently based on the idea that sperm competition, uh, um, that humans are adapted for sperm competition. This means the simultaneous presence of ejaculates from two or more men in, the, in a woman's tract at the same time. And somewhat embarrassingly, it's my own publisher who publishes a book by Robin, ba Robin Baker called Sperm Wars, in which he argues that humans are biologically adapted for such competition and um, has argued that uh, you can even see this in, in the shapes of the sperm, as I'll show you later. Now, the basic idea is, with sperm competition is that if several males uh, exist in a mating group with females, then you can get competition between sperms. Uh, whereas if you have a, a mating system or a social group with a single male, then sperm competition normally would not occur. And basically this comes to single male systems or monogamous systems with a single male and a single female or harem systems with one male and several females. And multi-male systems are systems where you have several adults of both sexes, and it's really that uh, that you need for uh, sperm competition to occur. And so if we look at this pattern here, you can see baboons in the middle there live in multi-male groups with several adult males, potentially mating with several females, Whereas langurs, for example, leaf monkeys typically live in harem groups, single male groups. Now, one way we can, we can look at this is by looking at relative testis size. In species that are adapted for sperm competition, you would expect the size of the testis relative to body size to be greater to produce more sperm to cope with that competition. And that is indeed exactly how it works. Uh, if you look at a plot of testis weight against body mass, you can see as expected, testis mass generally increases with body mass. But if you then look at the mating system, you can see a pretty neat separation. The monogamous species are shown in green, the multi-male species are shown in red, and the harem living or uh, poly uh, uh, polyg polygonous species are shown with the blue triangles. And you can see that those red circles, by and large, lie higher on the graph than either the green or the, or the blue. With, with just a few exceptions, there is virtually no overlap, and certainly at the upper end, you can see that humans lie below the overall best fit line, the human male has relatively small testes, and you see the orangutan uh, fits quite closely uh, with us, and the gorilla has even smaller testes, whereas the uh, chimpanzee has relatively large testes. And the next slide will show you a direct uh, comparison between the orangutan and the chimpanzee. And this is a, a male bonobo. In a chimpanzee or bonobo, the, egg, the uh, individual test is about the size of a large chicken's egg, whereas in an orangutan, as in a human, it's about the size of an arm of a, uh, a, a walnut. And so that comparison at the top there in uh, overall size uh, between chimpanzee and orangutan is close to the 
uh, comparison between chimpanzees and humans. Now at this point, I just want to uh, highlight a kind of argument that has been used. Uh, chimps and bonobos are our closest relatives in the evolutionary tree. And it has been argued by several people that because uh, we are more advanced that we must have evolved from a chimp-like condition. So the assumption has been that the common ancestor of humans and chimps um, was promiscuous. But we don't know that. That is an assumption. We need to reconstruct what was the likely condition. So I'll come back to that later. But that is what I call the frozen ancestor argument. The, the idea that the chimpanzee somehow shows the ancestral condition with no change as a frozen ancestor, and humans have to be more advanced. Uh, that is an assumption, as is not any kind of scientific result. That there, in fact, there is a bit of a problem with testis size. It could be that the environment infl influences testis size. We're getting a correlation here between whether a species is multi-male uh, or single male and whether there is relatively large or small testis size, but it could be that the environment is, is playing a part in that. One way of circumventing that is instead of looking at the testis is to look at the sperm itself because it's much, more, uh, much less likely that that is going to be subject to environmental change. And if we, uh, this is a beautiful study by a colleague of mine, Alan Dixon, and his team. And if you look at the structure of the sperm, here is the sperm head where the DNA sits. And then you have the midpiece, which is essentially the powerhouse of the sperm. And it's a ring of mitochondria, about 40 mitochondria. And then you have a tail, which, and they are driven by the energy provided by the mitochondria. And so the midpiece is essentially an indicator of the powerhouse of the Sperm. Now, you can make that same argument that in, if there is competition between males, you would expect the midpiece to be bigger uh, so that the sperm can swim more effectively. And that in species without sperm competition, you would expect smaller, smaller midpieces. Now, uh, if you look at this graph, the axis here, relative testis size is shown here as an indicator of that, and then you have mid-piece volume. Uh, because sperms and eggs don't change with body size, uh, you don't have to take body size into account here. So this is the mid-piece volume. And you can see that in this quadrant, the blue, pale blue quadrant, you have species that are adapted for single male mating systems. And in this quadrant, you have species that are adapted for multi-male mating with competition between males, humans are clearly within their pale blue group. So if you look at the sperms themselves, there is no indication that humans are biologically adapted in any special way for sperm competition. And there's also a female counterpart to this, which is that... Uh, you might expect similar changes in the female if the species is adapted for sperm competition. One expectation is the ovidact is going to become larger in species with sperm competition. That increases the distance sperm, sperms have to swim to reach the egg. And sure enough, you find that result. This is the relative size of the ovidact here, and uh, here is the lower quadrant humans. Uh, women have a relatively small overduct, short overduct. There is no evidence of adaptation for any kind of sperm competition, whereas chimps lie in here and clearly do. So I, I think the evidence is unequivocal that humans are biologically adapted for a mating system in which there is no regular sperm competition, and it's a single male mating system. Now, the question is, is that monogamy or harem living? I'm sure there are several people here who would dearly love to know. Are we biologically adapted uh, one way or the other? 
And in fact, there is uh, some evidence that we can adduce here. It's not too important, quite honestly, in the biological terms. The, the biologically important message is we are not adapted for sperm competition. But if we look at sexual dimorphism, which is um, difference between males and females in uh, features other than the sex organs, uh, one really regular finding from comparisons of primates is that you do not find sexual dimorphism in body size, skull shape, or size of the canine teeth in primates that are adapted for pair living like gibbons. And in a gorilla, by contrast, you have harem systems. So you have a male and several females, and there you find very pronounced sexual dimorphism. So once you move away from monogamy to a system where there are several females with a male, then you can get pronounced uh, dimorphism. What we find in humans is mild sexual dimorphism. It's more than you would expect for monogamy, uh, but it's at the lower end for polygyny. And uh, there, it is a bit complicated in humans because we share something unique in that we have a distinct difference in body composition. Uh, men uh, have less fat and more muscle than women who have proportionally more fat and less muscle. And among other species, it's the muscle body mass that counts for sexual dimorphism. So we're actually more sexually dimorphic than you would guess from just weighing us. And so the, the, evidence, the answer that comes is humans are probably adapted for mild polygyny. And this is supported by studies on facial adornment of various kinds. Uh, facial adornment in primates occurs typically in polygynous situations. You don't get it in monogamous primates and you don't get it in multi-male primates. It's something that is a specific signal of polygynous primates, and we, the fact that men have beards fits with that. And so this fits with the overall evidence that uh, humans, if you look cross-culturally, tend to have polygynous marriage patterns. So the, the rules of the society are set up that polygyny is allowable. By default, most men are monogamous because they cannot afford several wives, but uh, there are the vast majority of human societies in a cross-cultural survey sh showed polygyny as the dominant marital form. And so that fits quite closely with what we would conclude from the biological evidence. Now there's one uh, area which is of particular interest, which uh, actually brings some molecular evidence into the arena, and this is uh, in direct association with copulation. In primates that have sperm competition, you get formation of what is called a copulatory plug. The male copulates and the semen forms a firm plug in the female tract and, and then prevents immediate mating by other males. You see this in macaques here, and this is a more primitive primate, Loris. There's the plug. And if we look at the data on the right from the Dixon et al. group, they had four levels of coagulation of semen, and this is mild. This is no coagulation. There are no primates show no coagulation at all. Some primates show mild coagulation and there's moderate, and then there is formation of a firm copulatory plug. The chimpanzees and various prosimians and the macaques, as shown here, typically have these firm copulatory plugs. And in fact, uh, the two, two categories of, of moderate to pronounced coagulation occur in species with multi-male breeding systems. So if you have sperm competition, formation of population of copulatory plugs is common. And in the, uh, this column here for uh, mild coagulation, what happens in humans is you get temporary coagulation and then 
uh, fluid formation. Secondarily, you get the same thing in gorilla and in other primates that live in single male systems with a, a single breeding male and one or more females. So <clears throat> there is clear evidence here of a distinction between forming a firm copulatory plug where sperm competition is present and where sperm competition is absent, no firm copulatory plug. There is a protein that is responsible for the formation of the plug called seminogelin, which is produced by a single gene, uh, originally produced by a single gene, and then it, that gene duplicated. There are, in fact, two different seminogelin genes. I just want to present evidence from one of these, which is shown here. And this is the uh, a diagram of the gene with the subsections in humans. And so that is repeated here in a comparison with other primates. And what you can see is the structure of the gene in humans is essentially the same as in gibbons. And similar kind of structure is found in chimps, bonobo, gorilla, and orangutan, but they have these additional parts formed. And the orangutan forms an intermediate plug, so you get some kind of plug formation in orangutans. And it look, what, the easy way to interpret this is that it is primitive to have a simple gene. And then in species where secondary changes occurred, they have added sections into that gene, the pale green parts. And the most change has occurred in the chimpanzee. So that is what you would get if you did a, uh, a reconstruction of the evolutionary tree for that gene, is that humans are actually pretty close to the primitive condition, whereas the common ancestor of uh, uh, chimpanzee and bonobo underwent change, and that change was particularly far advanced in chimpanzee. So it's the chimpanzees that are advanced in this feature. They have become secondarily adapted for promiscuity, for sperm competition. And so we can't take that starting point that people have taken as saying, well, humans must have been promiscuous at the outset because that's what chimpanzees do. Uh, this evidence refutes that. Okay, now I, I mentioned the fact that I'd also say something about s s sperm shapes because this is a really interesting feature. Uh, Robin Baker, who wrote that book, book Sperm Wars, said that, uh, in fact, 1% uh, of human sperms are actually egg getters, and the other 99% are blockers and killers. And he invented the notion of kamikaze sperm. And so he suggested that uh, humans actually have uh, batches of sperm adapted for sperm competition. Uh, as I've tried to show you, there is no sperm competition, but um, that was his argument. And it arose out of a, a very interesting observation. People working on WHO on human sperm counts were surprised to see such a high percentage of deviant sperm, of sperm that were obviously misshapen. If you look at the top, they have an over big head or a double tail or a double head or a kinky tail or whatever, sperms that were clearly deformed. And the percentage of these is very high in human sperm. And so this was uh, worrying, but it was shown back in the 1980s that in fact, that high level of sperm uh, deformity found in humans is more likely to reflect poor quality control than any kind of adaptation for uh, sperm competition. We know that sperm, that sperm competition is a clear adaptation in chimps and gorillas. And if you look at the percentage of different sperm shapes, uh, of unusual sperm shapes found, it's uh, or it's over 25% in humans and almost 30% in gorillas. So almost a third of the ejaculate. Whereas if we look at chimps and bonobos, we're down to 5% or less. 
And so clearly what's happening where you have marked sperm competition between males is, is, is really tight sperm quality control and eliminating most of those sperms from the ejaculate because they're not doing any good at all. And uh, in humans and gorillas where you have single male mating systems, you don't need the quality control. You can just let it ride. And so I think what we're looking at is uh, poor quality control. Now, I uh, just want to finish off by looking at a more serious side of all of this because it's clearly worrying that sperm counts uh, are declining in many human populations. But this is going hand in hand with increasing problems with the male reproductive system. And this is shown early in development. There's a condition called cryptorchidism, where the testes do not descend into the testes by birth as they should do. And cryptorchidism is increasing in frequency. And particularly if you look at uh, zero to four and five to nine year age group, uh, the number of cases per 100,000 here, that is increasing quite dramatically. So there is an increase in cryptorchidism in the incidence of retention of the testes in the abdominal cavity. And that uh, is accompanied by an increase in testicular cancer. And this is really rather striking because despite various uh, problems we have with uh, the female reproductive system in terms of environmental toxins, uterine cancer and ovarian cancer have not significantly increased over the last 30 years in instance. Uh, cervical cancer is actually declining, which is encouraging. But uh, the one outstanding thing here is testicular cancer is rising dramatically. Uh, and we can see this in, if we do a comparison in Europe, for example, uh, and there are differences between countries uh, that are quite close to it. If we look at Denmark, the highest levels of testicular cancer found in the Euro-Scandinavian region are in Denmark, and yet almost next door in Finland we have one of the lowest levels. And this is almost certainly environmental in that case. We're not talking about any kind of genetic effect. This is an environmental effect that is taking place. And this is a worldwide map of the occurrence of testicular cancer. The, uh, the initial column uh, shows around 1960 to 70, and then the next column shows 20 years later. And in all cases, you can see the dark red box is generally increased. Uh, in Switzerland, for some reason, it was already high, so it's just stayed high. But in, there are very few countries where there's been any uh, reduction from the earlier period to the later period. And here we have Finland again with those very low levels, and Denmark with its very high levels, which are shown also in Norway. So worldwide, there are differences in the instance, but the general tendency is for those red boxes to be getting bigger. Testicular cancer is on the rise, and we don't know why. Um, but as I say, I suspect it's environmental. There have been various studies that have suggested factors that might be involved. One is maternal smoking. Uh, there is some pretty good evidence, so just a few studies suggesting that mothers who smoke during pregnancy may have sons who grow up to have problems with testicular cancer, with lowered sperm counts and with increased cryptorchidism. So it could be that this syndrome is partly affected by that. I'm sure this is multifactorial. I don't think there is a single factor that is going to explain the, this problem, declining sperm counts, or uh, other problems, but uh, my focus has gone on to environmental toxins that uh, are estrogen mimics. And the one I want to conclude by discussing is um, a substance called BPA, bisphenol A, which is a plastic hardener. 
and it has been used particularly in making babies' bottles. Uh, and in Europe, it is now forbidden to sell babies' bottles with uh, containing BPA. And this is an incredibly widely used plastic. It is used to line uh, tin cans to prevent corrosion of the tin cans. And you can recognize it fairly easily. It's used in the bottles for water coolers. If you see a triangle with a seven in it, then it is BPA or some close relative. Now, the interesting thing is uh, bisphenol A here, that is the structure of the molecule, and you'll see it has two carbon rings. Now, interestingly, uh, back in 1935, a British group of organic chemists was regularly testing uh, organic product byproducts of the petroleum industry and to see whether they had effects like those of steroid hormones. And at that time, the accepted wisdom was that like estrogen or testosterone, if you wanted to be a steroid hormone, you had to have four steroid, uh, you needed four carbon rings in that classical picture. That was the classical steroid molecule. And so they were quite surprised when they found that this whole group of substances, including bisphenol A, behave just like steroids. The, the standard test was to uh, remove the ovaries from a mouse, and then you would feed the chemical compound by uh, mouth, and if activity returned to the female's reproductive tract, then you knew there was estrogenic uh, activity of that substance. That entire family, including bisphenol A, in 1935 was shown to be an estrogen mimic. And we are using it in all kinds of different products today. And I, I'm, I won't go on about this. If you want to ask questions, I can ask. But I think this is at least one substance we should be looking really carefully at. Uh, just to finish on a note, it occurred to me that the reason that all tin cans typically have a, a layer of BPA is, is to prevent corrosion. So I said, well, wouldn't we want to do this with water pipes? And so I went on the internet to see whether we are using BPA to line copper water pipes to reduce the level of corrosion. And indeed we are, not all of them. But BPA is also being used for that. And so you can actually get BPA delivered directly into your water supply. Thank you. So we have some time for questions now, if somebody would like to ask. I mean, these are adults, <coughs> but then apart from that, I guess, I think they need to have some questions. But it is very interesting that there clearly are differences in the countries between the groups. Well, the life span is different. The cancer frequency will be different. That's right, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, this is simply crude occurrence rates, so this doesn't go any deeper than that. And it's primarily to show that there is a difference between the two periods, to show that generally there has been an increase in the next race, but this is not meant to be precise. How about something more generic, like stress? Stress? Yeah. yeah. No. Well, that causes a lot of changes in their physiology. Yeah. I, 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 would, I, I think stress has a part to play as well. And, uh, 
in fact, some dynamic research is connected with the relationship between stress and very well. So, I, I, I was working on treasures at the time. And in a tissue that you stress, and the male should have the same testes, and they, uh, but in other stress conditions, they would be tracked back into body cavity, and they shut down somatic answers. And if you keep two males together in the cage for 15 days, eventually the second male will die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and essentially, this kidney is stressed out you know, by stress. Mm -hmm. So I should be able to explore that your stress has effects, uh, which you appreciate to buy it. So are you being trying to ask you? Yeah, I mean, what's the difference between that part of the film that comes in the line? You know, I'd love to know. I wish some of you have been in the line of that. I just want to try to find out. I was at a conference in Denmark to present my book. I was particularly interested in that question. Uh, why? Is Finland, Finland, so close to Denmark, so why does Denmark have these very high rates? Is it because of, uh, Denmark is highly uh, urbanized and it's not? It, it's possible. One of the arguments has been that Denmark has very high levels of internal smoking. So that means that in Denmark, uh, the levels of modern smoking is particularly high. Uh, but the key point that I didn't have time to mention, or that I should mention, is that the film is now going away at Denmark. So, whatever it was that was playing in their favor is not playing in their favor anymore. But we don't know what it is, and maybe it's looked into whatever uh, differences there may be. I mean, were they not using the EPA? I mean, I did start checking that on the On the internet, there are big differences in the way that different European countries use the mm -hmm. And there was evidence that uh, Finland was using significantly less BPA mm -hmm. generally than Denmark, so that could be another factor. So there's more BPA. Sorry? There's more BPA. is to limit this and the BPA for example has been sent to uh, FDA for examination a number of times and as far as I know has not yet changed its stand and the official stand of the FDA in the United States is that uh, there is no danger in using BPA and I believe it's true in in Europe, you, you're not allowed to use BPA in babies' bottles. I think it's still permissible at, this, at the country level in the United States. I think there are individual states that have banned using BPA in bottles, but I, I don't think the FDA has. So, I mean, it's really up to the FDA to, to vet these products and see whether they're acceptable. On, but I just find it unbelievable that we would ever allow products which in 1935 were known to behave as estrogens enter general use into this way. Uh, you know, that, that should never have happened in the first place in my view. Getting back to that question that the gentleman here had about the difference between the black and the white that being so different in the United States. I think we all know that there's, uh, in large cities, there's food deserts in large, large cities where the black race is not, they don't have access to You know, there, there are a lot of, you can, you can find explanations for this. I, I would simply emphasize that those data are not precise enough 
to make that kind of comparison. My main point was to show that testicular cancer is on the rise, generally, and that is obvious because you're comparing like with like. You're comparing the same community 20 years later. Uh, but as was pointed out, if you have different uh, mortality uh, curves for the t for two populations, you're going to get differences. So I wouldn't go into discussing this. I don't think the data are good enough. Well, the take-home message I want people to have from that is that testicular cancer is rising. Nobody has really looked at this, and one of the problems with sperm counts is the data is essentially confined to the industrialized world. Israel is, an, uh, is one of the southernmost examples that we have. Most of the data we're looking at are from the United States and from Europe and Scandinavia, and uh, some from Asia, not very much, and we don't have good enough data from uh, non-industrialized countries to know what's going on. So one very uh, simple answer we could get if people did the surveys would be to know whether there is any significant decline in sperm counts in, say, Sri Lanka or Bangladesh or somewhere like that. Population size and density. And, um, no. No. No, I mean, uh, we, uh, people have not really shown enough interest in, in the basic data we need to know what's going on. And WHO, the best data that are available worldwide are for WHO, but um, those data are essentially from that same subset of countries. We, we really don't know what's going on in the third world. So I thought that the slide where you saw 1950 down to, let's say, 1990, Right. Oh. After World War II, you had large corporations coming in from Piedmont and now displaying massive amounts of you know, uh, pesticides in the environment. Also, at the same time, from an economic standpoint, you had the automobile taking place, you had people leaving the active lifestyle and things like this. So I think the xenobiotic or xenomestrogenic theory, you know, or hypothesis is totally legit, but at the same time, you have to look at how daily life has changed. Not only from exercise, body mass, muscle mass, bone density, but also too, the diurnal and like circadian rhythms change at the same time. So you're going to be up in the daytime, you're going to sleep at the same time, you're watching television at night, you have lights up at night, Effects, right. You know, you know the hormone profile and, and things like that. Also, too potentially yeah. mate selection as well. Maybe mid beginning of the 20th century, you still had people, who, you know, who wanted the strongest mates and wanted to compete. Whereas now it's more the most intelligent person, the person who can make money. Maybe not the best sperm quality, but the best bank account. Yeah. You know what you're saying is so important, and I, I really do want to emphasize this because clearly. Many, many different factors are involved, and it's incredibly difficult to get hard scientific evidence of, of, and to just isolate one factor and, and show that it really is important. My gut feeling is BPA is one of those factors, that, uh, just as an example, but I think environmental toxins generally are a category, but they are just one category. That whole lifestyle change, and one thing you mentioned in passing, which is discussed in my book in a separate chapter, is uh, our biological adaptation for day length and for annual variation, because we have inbuilt biological clocks, the, the circadian one for the 24-hour cycle, and we have a circennial clock for the entire year. And there is still a basic signal there for seasonal reproduction in humans which we presumably retained from when we left Africa. And so the, um, that is the, and there is evidence that working on shifts, for example, increases the incidence of cancer. So uh, interfering with circadian rhythms in a regular way is apparently not a good thing to do either. So 
Um, there, are, there are many factors. It isn't just BPA. It isn't just uh, circadian rhythms. It, it, there are lots of other things. Getting this decline in stroke house, then the increase in testicular cancer and the increase in the increase in the cryptocytism? Yeah. But I, is there any connection between those three trends? Yeah. It's interesting because they occur in parallel. And so I mentioned that uh, Finland is now beginning to show higher, uh, well, it's beginning to show lower sperm count, so it's beginning to follow in the, in the direction of Denmark. And at the same time, it's showing a rise in testicular cancer and in cryptorchidism. So it's precisely what you would predict if those three things are connected to one another. But it's correlational. We don't have a mechanism that links those three. Sorry? That's an excellent point, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, there was one slide that showed that uh, compared the rates of testicular cancer versus urinary cancer and ovarian cancer. Yeah. Um, and I, my eyes were correct. I feel like the, the y-axis scale is different for the testicular cancer ones and the other ones. I'm just wondering if the, because of the change, the statistically wasn't as severe. Is it, I mean, is it significant enough to go beyond just... Yeah. I think it's this one, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're all 1970 to 2000, aren't they? Uh, but on the, on the y-axis, <coughs> oh. yeah, the y-axis, uh, yeah, they're different scales depending on the disease. All, all I'm interested in is the change, not the level. I, I, there's one last one. One last question. Uh, yeah, I was uh, uh, considering that uh, we cultivate uh, large areas that they are without rain, and so we use river water to uh, irrigate, and the irrigate, irrigating water from rivers carry the minerals that they are dissolved in the mountains. One of them is selenium, which is a very indispensable for our life, but it's poisonous uh, in there. And the uh, United States is selling selenium contaminated food from California to China. Uh, it is not a bad deal because the Chinese lack some of the selenium, but I was wondering how much of this contaminated food was being distributed in the United States before we found yeah. out. I don't know. It, it's another factor, as I say. I think there are probably many different factors involved. It is clearly a complex issue. But I think there are certain things that are sticking their heads up above the parapet. Yeah. Okay, I... try to extract BPA, whether it's inside pipes or bottles. The plastic is extracted, or it's called finisher. So you don't have any free BPA. So this data showing BPA causes me concern because if you look at the in-depth studies, there's no correlation with the polymers they use for mining keys. Well, I, I would just have a response to respond to me. I'm not an, an environmentalist or hard coding. I'm pretty objective to science. Right. I would add to that, though, 
and we'd like to see how much BPA you test, because a lot of these xenobiotics, at minute levels, they don't have anything. They, they come in, they go out, they, they retoxify them, they don't block receptors. At large levels, the, the, there's, a, there's a fine line, there's a threshold, either too low or too high, where they don't have the effects. You need to have a large sample size. So. I think we'll be able to move these conversations out. Um, let's all thank Bob for be signing books outside here, so uh, pick up a cotton. $20, how can you go home? I, I just like to thank you all for coming. And I, sh I should have said at the, be at the beginning uh, that uh, I was delighted that C2ST uh, invited me to give this presentation. I think C2ST is a wonderful organization for getting scientists together with the public in the Chicago region. It's a young organization, but it's taken off like a rocket, and I'm very grateful that I was invited to be part of this.